So I have the uh, pleasure of teaching reluctant undergraduates about animal behavior in their first year and about the history of science in their final year. In between doing that, uh, I'm lucky enough to study birds, and this is a selection of the bird species that I've studied over my career. And of those, um, this one is the one I've spent most time studying, uh, guillemots on the island of Skoma off the coast of Wales. And in fact, this year was my 40th field season on Skoma. So I did guillemots for my PhD and loved it so much, loved them so much, uh, carried on. This is Skoma. And just to give you a feel for what it's like in a guillemot colony, I've got a little bit of video here. It's very noisy. It's also very smelly, but I can't recreate the smell in here. These birds nest at phenomenal densities of up to 70 pairs per square meter. So on one of these tables, you could have 70 pairs of guillemots. When I started my PhD, they were very endangered. The population on Skoma had been about 100,000 pairs in the 30s. By 1972, when I started, it had fallen to 2,000. Since then, uh, since 1980, the numbers have gone up steadily and back to about 20,000. And I'm hoping that I'm still around if they carry on increasing back to 100,000 because it'll be absolutely fantastic. So they're like little penguins, but they can fly. And I realized that I kind of knew more about in birds from studying guillemots than almost any species. And they're so like us in so many different ways. Uh, we both live in high-rise apartments. Uh, we both live at incredible densities. Uh, we form long-term pair bonds with our partners, sometimes lasting 25 or almost 30 years. They're incredibly affectionate to each other. And uh, they're not averse to a bit on the side. <laughs> and on one particular day, I had a hide uh, wedged between a, a cleft in the rock that was a long hands and knee crawl. And it's one of my favorite places during my PhD. And I was very close. I was closer than this to the birds. And it felt as though you were in the colony. It's just absolutely fantastic. You had to be very quiet and uh, not move around too much. And on one occasion, there was a bird sitting in front. I've recreated this here. There was a bird sitting in front of me like this. And suddenly, and it was incubating its egg, and it suddenly stood up and started giving its greeting call. And I thought, this is very odd. They never do this unless their partner is present. So what the hell is going on? I looked out to sea, and there were lots of birds flying backwards and forwards. And about 700 meters away, this is the flight bit, by the way, I could see a bird flying in. And to my absolute amazement, it landed beside my focal bird, and they carried on doing their clashing of beaks and greeting service. And at that moment, my entire perception of birds and guillemots changed forever, because I realized that this bird had recognized its partner at some phenomenal distance. When I'm a meter away <coughs> from these birds, they all look identical. But this bird had seen and recognized its partner <coughs> from a considerable distance. The business of them having good eyesight wasn't particularly special, but I realized that there was something very particular going on. And I classify myself as what's called a behavioral ecologist. I'm interested in the evolution of behavior and ecology. But there was no pigeonhole to put that observation. And I was deeply frustrated by that. But what I did was to put it to the back of my mind where it was safe, and it came out uh, about 30 years later. So that's the bird doing greeting. OK, I was a bit of a nerd when I was young. I read all sorts of stuff. And I remember another incident when I was about 10 years old. And I'd read that dogs could only see in black and white. I remember telling my mum this, and there she is. And she was completely scathing. She said, don't be ridiculous. How could they possibly know that? They can't see through a dog's eyes. I was crushed. And I've never forgiven her. And I never miss an opportunity to remind her that I don't forgive her about that. In fact, we do know a lot about that. And my mum was no philosopher, you can tell by the way she's dressed, by the way, um, but she anticipated this philosopher, Thomas Nagel, by about 20 years, who raised the question, what is it like to be a bat? You could also ask what it's like to be a bird. And Nagel reckoned that you could never know what it's like to be another human being. And he, to, to generate his argument, he said, we could never know what it's like to be another species. And he chose a bat because he, at that time anyway, thought that bats were very similar to us being mammals, but had a sense, the ability to echolocate, that humans don't have. 
In fact, I'm much more optimistic than Thomas Nagel, um, and I think there are lots of ways scientists now can know what it's like to be some other organism. Obviously, you can't know completely what it's like, but we've got a set of tools that we can use. So you can just look at the relative size of organs like eyes. So that first bird's an owl at night jar, depends very much on vision. The kiwi beside it doesn't. You can use physiology. We can now do MRI scanning of a zebra finch brain. The zebra finch is only this big, which is a fraction of the size of our own brain. And you can play it its own song or somebody else's song and see which bits of its brain light up. I think this is the future for behavior. We can also use behavior, like with my guillemots. They spend lots of time grooming each other. It's just like you petting your dog. The dog loves being groomed. When you stop, it comes and nuzzles up to you and says, come on, do some more. Or if you're doing something unpleasant to it, like beating it, it moves away. So you can use behavior. You can also use molecular techniques. I'm just going to give you two examples of the kind of senses that birds use in conducting their lives. And the first one is hearing. This is a great horned owl from the tundra. This bird hunts for mice and lemmings under the snow entirely by hearing. It can't see them at all. How does it do it? It's got a fantastic set of adaptations. It has this huge facial disc, absolutely remarkable. And when I was researching this, I thought, well, I actually need to get my hands on a great gray owl. And I happened to know somebody that had a pair of them. They agreed to catch them for me, and they did. And it's uh, huge. It's like holding a massive baby. And that's what I thought, anyway. Um, and I wanted to see a bit more in detail about this facial disc and the ear. So I put my hand into the side by the, about here, and I was absolutely amazed because my hand disappeared up to here. Basically, that whole structure is feathers. And you can see how big the feathers are or how small the bird is if I superimpose the skull on top of this. Basically, the great horned owl is a midget in a giant duvet. <laughs> now, that facial disc is a sound collecting device. It's like the kind of things that um, sound people use. What about the ears themselves? It's actually very tricky looking at a great horned owl's ear on your own because you have to hold its beak and its feet. You actually need three hands. But the, very gently, I lifted up the feathers around that facial disc, and you just see the beginning of the ear there. And then here it is in all its glory. And I just think this is one of the most fabulous structures I've ever seen as a biologist. It's so sophisticated. It's got all these kind of struts and things here that tell me that the owl can control the opening and closing of that flap very uh, specifically. Also reminds me of a, a kind of grubby human ear as well. But just look at these fantastic feathers around the outside, these broad base ones here becoming fine up here. And then these feathers here are like a phalanx of Roman swords at the back of the facial disc to stop the sound going any further and pushing it down into the ear itself. What about the ears themselves? Well, if you identify where they both are, they're positioned asymmetrically. So one here and one here. Why is that? You want to maximize the distance between the two ears to maximize the time interval that the sound reaches the two ears. We don't have that problem because our heads are so big, but if you're a bird, um, you have to do a, a trick like this. And it's this asymmetry in the positioning of the ears together with that fantastic sound collecting device that allows great horned owls to pinpoint a mouse under the snow and catch it with unerring accuracy. The second sense I want to tell you about is the sense of touch. And I'm going to start by saying something about flight. When birds are flying, a crucial thing, it's a bit like you going out on a windy day in a, a loose coat. If everything's flapping around, it's rather inconvenient and uncomfortable. Birds are very particular about the positioning of their feathers. And you probably never thought about it, but how does a bird in flight keep its feathers in exactly the right location? And the answer is it uses these structures here. So if you've ever plucked a chicken or a pheasant at Christmas time, you see these structures, they're called phyloplumes. These are the bits that... Uh, if you're on a, a TV chef, you singe off before you put it in the oven. And these phyloplumes are specifically linked, in many cases, to a proper feather. So here's a body feather, and here's the phyloplume in the same kind of follicle. And so the end, the base of that phyloplume in there is just full of sensory nerve endings. And that's how the bird is controlling the position of its feathers. It's monitoring what's going on whilst it's flying, whilst it's walking around. For me, 
feeding the ducks when I was little was one of the most banal bits of animal behavior you could ever witness. So banal that nobody ever gives it a second thought. But in fact, what's happening when ducks are foraging in muddy water like this is phenomenally sophisticated. You tend to think of a duck's beak as being inanimate, plastic, looks as though nothing's going on. It is more sensitive than your fingertips. What's going on in a duck's beak is phenomenal. And this was discovered remarkably in the 1660s by a guy called John Clayton who dissected a duck's head and said, look at all these massive nerves, three big nerves, two on the top, one on the bottom, going down to the tip of the beak. And he perceptively said this, ducks have three pairs of nerves whereby we conceived that they had the accuracy to distinguish what was proper food and what was be, to be rejected. In other words, he sussed out in 1660 that what was going on inside a duck's mouth was what enabled it to distinguish between mud and something worth eating in the mud. And here's a close-up modern picture of the top of a beak. These are the nerves coming down, fanning out around the edge of the bill tip. This is a duck I found dead on the road on the Norfolk coast. Uh, this is actually um, this is what zoologists do, I'm afraid. Um, this is the lower mandible. This is the tongue. I want you to just have a look at this rim here. Now, I'm just going to talk about this, but what I'm saying applies to the whole of the beak. Close up at that rim, even closer, look at each pit has something in it. And a colleague of mine, Herman Burkhood in the Netherlands in the 1970s, dissected this out and showed that the structure was something like this. So there's that tip that projects out of here. But inside, that curly bit is a blood vessel because you need blood to get oxygen to the things. And these little bits here are bundles of, well, these are nerve endings. And then each of those is attached to a thread, a nerve coming out of here, which then feeds into here and goes back to the brain. And the duck, um, using these sensors, has phenomenal sensitivity. And it's using this plus other sensors in, deep inside the mouth that allows it to distinguish between edible and inedible food. I thought I'd test this on one of my students. So I gave her the challenge of eating some muesli. See how she gets on. She does that pretty well. And then she's going to add to that a bowl of gravel that I swept off the road. And I said to her, just give it a mix-up. Uh, I said, and um, whatever you do, don't eat it, I said. <laughs> okay. And uh, you can't do it. You cannot do what a duck can do because we just don't have the degree of sensitivity inside our mouths that ducks have. A fabulous example of touch in birds involves this bizarre bird from South and Central America called a finfoot. And this is somewhere between a duck and a grebe. And uh, this is, I've seen these in, in Central America. They're fabulous birds, very shy, very hard to study. And they are unique amongst birds in that the male only has a pit under his arm in which he carries the chick. The chick is born blind and naked, has to have a good sense of touch to get into there. There's feathers over that to protect it. But the dad has to have a good sense of touch to make sure the chick is in there. One on each side, he can fly with these. It's only been seen twice, one in 1837 by a German and one in 1960. My final example involves this invisible bird, which is a redneck nightjar. I've been doing field work in Zambia, and if you close in on a nightjar, you can see that around their mouth they have these fantastic bristles. They're called rictal bristles. They're sensory, but nobody knows how they're used. Some people suggest that when the bird is foraging and they're nocturnal and they feed on moth, these help to provide a net that increases the size of the otherwise absolutely enormous mouth. I think that's unlikely. Another suggestion is that they stop the bits of the moth when it hits the moth, the, the scales that come off going into their eyes. That seems unlikely. But what I do think is happening is that the bristles, this is an infrared bit of film uh, of a day old night jar chick. It just hatched in the day and we set the camera up at night. It's totally black for the birds. They are relying almost entirely on touch. And the chick has got to make contact with the adult's beak in order to get a meal. And the, the adult has to find the chick. You can see it's a bit of a problem. Finally, after a bit of faffing about, whoops, they've made contact. Those bristles are coming into their own at this point. The adult regurgitates moth soup into the chick and the chick is satisfied. And the adult flies off and gets another one. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.